Welcome, everyone. We have a very special lightning talk today from the folks at Arise. Aparna and Jason are going to be talking to us about embeddings and embeddings on unstructured data and how to monitor these embeddings and unstructured data. Really, it is not an easy feat. Like, let's be honest, monitoring on unstructured data, they talk about how difficult it can be and why it is difficult. So Aparna breaks down embedding so clearly. It's so nice to see how she says what exactly they are. I imagine most of us out there know what it is, but it's a nice little revamp in case you've been saying the word like me and don't 100% understand what it means. Anyway. We've got to give huge thanks to the folks at Arise for sponsoring the community. They are sponsoring this episode. And at the end of this lightning talk, you get to see a little bit of a demo on how Arise is dealing with unstructured data and how you can use Arise to combat that. So enjoy this lightning talk and we'll see you on the next one. We did a survey of our, our teams and 80% of the data out there that teams deal with in a production setting is unstructured data. And then, you know, add on to that 0.1% of that data is not, is labeled. You cannot tell what this, you know, it, it's very hard for a model to understand if what it's doing and how it's acting on this data is correct. Very tough to work with. And what this adds, the challenges this adds to is that this data can change underneath teams and you can be completely unaware of it. It's hard to know when unstructured data is different than when you built it on when you built it. It's it's also doubly hard to know if the decisions your models are making on unstructured data are correct in production. It's not labeled. Very very hard environment to work in, and it's very different than the environment the model was built in, which typically is 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 great. It's got. Uh, English words, well-formed, uh, very, very clean data, which is what the model's built to, built on to act on. When it, you put the model in production, the data can look very different. It can be Spanish versus English words. The data could you know the data can be drastically different than what you what you saw in in your production uh, in, in production versus your your training environments. And what this means to teams is performance might drop. The data it's acting on is very different than what it was built on, and it's not doing what you want it to do. This gets even harder for large, complex, deep learning models, which is where embeddings come in, and our partner is going to tell you a bit about that. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, embeddings are everywhere. That you know, if you take anything away from this talk that Jason and I are, are part of, I, I hope it's that embeddings are everywhere. They're in GPT-3, they're behind Dolly 2, released by OpenAI, and they're really the backbone behind a lot of the deep learning models and complex models deployed, deployed out there. And because they're everywhere, they're really the perfect interface to use to troubleshoot these types of models. Whether it's a computer vision model looking at, is this a cancer cell or not, or it's an NLP model doing speech recognition. Embeddings are the internal representation of what the models learn, and it's passed to Arise for observability. And we'll explain a little bit today about our new product launch that we've, that we've just recently released to the public that supports unstructured data and embeddings. So first off, what are embeddings? Well, Embeddings, you can think about it really as this mathematical, you know, vector representation of the data that captures some of the, the, the semantic meaning. Um, this data could be words, like in this example here. Um, in this case, we'd call it a word embedding. But embeddings can also represent images, audio signals, um, large chunks of unstructured data. And what it does is it... it, it compresses the data and it preserves the relationships within your data. So words that are similar to each other will show up. Uh, we'll have a vector that's closer together in distance. Words that are further apart from each other will, will be further apart. And so you can think about it as really output of these uh, deep learning layers that 
that contain the structure of what the models learn and can be used to troubleshoot unstructured models. Um, and it's really the best way to get at the why behind AI. And you might be wondering, well, well hey, Aparna, well, isn't that what explainability is for? Isn't explainability supposed to give me my why? Um, well, explainability actually might not always be the best thing to, to help you troubleshoot this type of data. And I'll give you an example. This is um, an image you know, classification use case, trying to predict, is this a panda or not? And if you use something like an integrated gradients, what it would actually show you is which pixels in these images were most relevant to the prediction, whereas most relevant to the classification of is this a panda or not. But just knowing as a, you know, as a data scientist or an ML engineer, knowing what pixels may not always be the most helpful to help you troubleshoot, well, why did the model make that decision? Versus an embedding, you can think about the embedding as really this internal slice of what the models learned. Um, compressed into a single vector. And that embedding can, can contain information like, uh, you know, well, does this image have uh, of a panda have um, similar features to a bear? Does it have, what color fur does it have? Um, what color is this panda's face? And so you can actually learn some of the structure of what the models learn and it can be much more useful in troubleshooting these types of unstructured data than explainability even can be. And so what we launched really is leveraging embeddings to be able to do observability for unstructured data. What we've launched monitors every single embedding, identifies patterns of change across these embeddings, and then provides tools to be able to export problematic samples to use for either better labeling or better data quality measures if the data itself needs to be fixed. And let me tell you a little bit of how this works. So what we do is collect, monitor, and index every single embedding. So this is every production inference that your model is making. We monitor the embedding and we bubble up when there's problematic segments. So in the example that Jason was sharing, where there is Spanish words now being tossed into the data, um, it would actually identify those problematic segments and then also find similar examples to those problematic segments. So because we're collecting all of the production data, we can actually bubble up where the problems are, where the model is not doing so well, what are outliers when there's changes, and then go back through all of the production inferences to find similar data points that can then be exported to either a labeling provider or uh, sent back to your data team to figure out what changed um, and how it's impacting your model. And let me go a little bit into the technical details of, of how we do this. So we actually measure a concept called embedding drift. Um, what we're doing is actually collecting all these embedding vectors and then looking at the distance between a baseline group of vectors and then what the model is actually seeing in production. And the distance itself, you can think about it as um, either Euclidean distance or cosine distance, but we're, we're looking at basically a baseline group of vectors, and then that distance is taken at, in, in the high dimensional space. Um, and so it's looking at the distance between um, maybe your training data set, which could be your baseline, versus what actually the model is seeing in, in production. And then there's workflows when drift has been detected to actually drill down into interactive visualizations to identify what are those problematic segments or groups that are, are causing that, that drift. And so in this example here, you might see um, a, a pocket of data here, which is kind of the, the Spanish data, the, the Spanish data points. And you can actually see that there's an outlier group that's showing up just in production, wasn't there in training really quickly. Uh, ML engineer, data scientist can grab this and say, well, looks like we need to label more data from a different language that the model is now seeing in production. And what this is really creating is a workflow to be able to export problematic samples to fix underlying data quality or data issues, really empowering this data-centric AI workflow to collect issues, collect data from production, understand when that data has actually changed, troubleshoot it, and then use that same data to go back and fix your data 
to improve the models. And I'll show you how all this works with a quick demo of the product itself. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is actually the Arise product itself. Um, what you can see in the Arise product is um, not only, so this is an example, same, same example we've been going through, which is kind of uh, a model which is collecting reviews. These reviews can be, you know, every e-commerce company probably has an MO model that's looking at the reviews that customers are providing under these products. And what we're looking at here is the model schema not only has structured data, but also has unstructured data, which now users can provide uh, through, through embeddings. These embeddings can then be collected. In this case, it's a text vector. And these embeddings can then be monitored for drift. And in this example here, what I'm going to show you is at some time period, looks like in May and June, uh, the text vector wasn't experiencing any drift. I can actually go and take a look at that data itself right now. Um, and it looks like there's kind of two big pockets of data, group of data points where the reviews are positive, group of data points where the reviews are negative. Um, so looks like there's kind of a, you know, two, two broad segments of reviews. But at some point, kind of mid-June, it looks like there's actually some spike in this text vector. It means the data has actually changed need to understand what's changed in the underlying data. And this is extremely complicated to troubleshoot. I can't tell you, you know, you think troubleshooting regular ML is hard, troubleshooting unstructured data, there's really no tools to be able to do this out there at, at production, at scale. And so what you can see here is, I can zoom in and look at kind of a, again, a 3D visualization using UMAP of, that time window when there was actually drift in this vector in this vector. And it's very clear there's a group of data points here that's actually distinctly different than, than what I'm used to seeing when there wasn't any drift. I can actually zoom in, go look at the, the how the structure of the data has actually changed. I can go click on individual data points. And it's really clear once I go look at the raw data, these are my Spanish data points that are showing up in production, wasn't there in training vastly different model doesn't really know what to do with these data points. It's not doing so well on these data points. And product was able to figure out that there was drift in this type of complex vectors and data in the product. Hopefully that gives you a little teaser of what we've released and what we've launched and really encourage all teams that have unstructured data to, to give it a shot, give it a try. Feature of ML is going to involve unstructured data and we're gonna need better tools to be able to troubleshoot this type of data. Thanks everyone.